What's up class and welcome to another lesson in the no mod shop class here on the school zone. Today I have a compilation video for you. It's a menagerie, a smorgasbord, a veritable buffet of miscellaneous building tips. 15 of them in fact. And this is only part one. I've mentioned in a few past videos in the comment section that I was going to be assembling these tips based on both viewer suggestions as well as follow-ups to my past lessons. These are discoveries I made after I posted a video on a particular topic, but they didn't merit their own isolated videos. Instead, I wrote them down so I could compile them into this video. I'll mention which video it stemmed from so you can go check that out if you want if you haven't already seen it. I'll also credit the people in the description of the video that contributed some of these suggestions. Not all of them came from viewer suggestions but a lot of them did. With some of the tips though there was like a dozen or more people that made the exact same suggestion but if they were singular suggestions in the comment sections of those videos then you'll see that name down below as a token of my appreciation. So let's get started. Tip number one. So the first follow-up tip actually comes from my first tips video. In tip number two of that video, I mentioned that you can add the left bumper and hold the bottom button to move settlement objects up and down, and you can hold the right bumper and the bottom button to move objects forward and back. Well, it seems in most cases you don't actually need the right bumper. You can skip that and just hold the bottom button to move things around on a horizontal plane. You will need the left bumper though to move things vertically. Tip number two comes from my follow-up video about the settlement size glitch where I showed you guys how you can use folders to reduce the size meter. It was all part of a fun experiment to get down to what was really the computational value for the size meter. Well, something else that's also weightless and much more likely to be in your inventory is ammo. In fact, missiles and mini nukes are really good at reducing the size meter because of their polygon complexity. Tip number three, I also mentioned in that video how you can speed up the menu selection by holding the arrow on the D-pad as well as the bumper. Well, it turns out holding the trigger will speed it up as well. Tip number four comes from my video on how to get a glowing mutant wolf for your settlement. Turns out that you can actually get a glowing mutant hound from Ericsson as well. If you buy Gracie and you return at a higher level, the next mutant hound might be glowing. Unfortunately, however, it won't actually be glowing. The glowing title is a strength designation, not a physical characteristic. So it'll look the same as a regular mutant hound, but it'll be tougher and deal more damage. I still like the wolves better for the aesthetics for my settlements, but the mutant hounds may have one advantage over both the dogs and the wolves. I have a mutant hound at one of my settlements, and whenever she howls at enemies, it acts like a siren for the other settlers. So they'll draw their guns faster and rush to her aid. Now, I can't confirm that's an actual game function, so don't quote me on that, but that's what I've directly observed every time the settlement gets attacked. And that very well could be one of the special attributes of a mutant hound. Tip number five comes from my video on neon lighting. In the video I mentioned that you can't combine complementary colors to any particular effect. Well, that is true if we're dealing directly with color theory. You know, mixing paints with complementary colors, for example, will just result in brown. But because we're also dealing with the RGB model of color, since it's digitally light based, you can actually combine complementary colors. I don't have the nifty names for the colors like I did in that video, but I do have an example. The cat meat neon sign at my Jamaica Plain schoolhouse is a combination of orange and purple, I think, to create this sort of salmon color. So feel free to give those other color combinations a try as well. In fact, if you want to head over to my subreddit and make up some names for particular color combinations, you know, start a new thread with that. Help some other people out as well. Tip number six isn't actually a tip so much as a follow up to my neon symbols video that I did. At the end of the video, I asked for viewer suggestions and actually got several that were totally doable. So I thought I'd show them off to you here. Names of those who suggested these are in the description below. Tip number seven, I made a video on an easy way to figure out which way your furniture is facing when it comes to interactive items like benches, stools, and beds, that sort of thing. Well, after posting that video, I got flooded with comments about an even easier way to my easier way. <laughs> Turns out if you align an item in your workshop menu, it'll align all the items that way when placing them. This was a great example of something I learned from you guys along with the very next tip. Tip number eight, 
In my Pillar Glitch video, I asked if anyone had a suggestion for preventing the annoying item popping effect that happens when you group select. And again, after a flood of comments, turns out the solution is so simple. You just have to make sure the item that you're about to group select is the last item you've selected. There's something about group selecting focusing on the last item you've built or selected. So the jumping effect only happens when you've built or selected something else and then try to group select on a previous item. So all you have to do is repin the focus, so to speak, on the item you're about to group select and you're golden. So just quickly select it and unselect it, then you can group select and you won't have the jumping effect. It's become such a habit for me now that it's almost like clearing your palette, you know? Tip number nine, you've probably learned through my lessons that you can't rug glitch items that are snappable. But once in a while, you might think you have an item that doesn't snap to anything, but it still can't be rug glitched. Well, this exclusion of the rug glitch is remarkably consistent in the workshop system. So if you think you can't snap something, yet it can't be rug glitched, chances are it actually does snap to something. But what you may not realize is that this principle also applies to items that snap to themselves or don't snap to anything but can be snapped to, as in they are the snappy, <laughs> which is a brand new word I just made up for items like this post. Tip number 10. In case you were ever curious which item in your workshop came from which DLC, there is a little symbol in the upper right hand corner of the item that indicates which DLC it comes from. I knew about that, I just never bothered to look up what the symbols represented, so in my earlier videos I was always guessing. Why Bethesda couldn't put a little key legend in there somewhere is beyond me. But that's what I did for you, so here's what each symbol represents. Tip number 11. My gun rack video is where I first broke out the cycling lights to use in a video for you guys. I explained quite a bit about them, but one thing I forgot to mention was the order of the colors has a logic behind it. The order of the colors corresponds to the order of frequencies in the visible light spectrum. You may remember Roy G. Bibb from your science class, or you'll learn it if you're not there yet. That stands for red, orange, yellow, green, blue, and violet. That's an easy mnemonic to remember when you're searching for the perfect color in the cycling lights and you, you know, keep scrolling through forgetting where the color you want is placed. Tip number 12. I like to use the various nuclear type generators for powering my settlements because, you know, they generate more power and are generally silent. But if you like to use the gas power generators for whatever reason, maybe it fits along with the style of your build, then there's a way to ever so slightly reduce the noise they make if that annoys you. If you activate the generator on and off, it cycles through various sound patterns. It's super duper subtle, so you may not notice it at first, but if you play with it for a bit, you may find a more pleasant hum that isn't so annoying, you know what I'm saying? Tip number 13. In the video I posted about where your junk is safe, one of the topics I covered was settlers stealing your stash. Mostly weapons, but settlers do steal stuff. It's just a fact. If it hasn't happened to you yet, consider yourself lucky. Some people say it's because they're under-equipped, but I have literally found settlers with dozens and dozens of weapons that they're not even using in their inventory that they took from containers where I had stored stuff to sell. It's hard to say what the AI was thinking in those cases. Maybe settlers have personalities and hoarder is one of the personality types that they can acquire. But there's a way you can prevent it. Two things I've found settlers unable to interact with are switches and mannequin racks. So if you build an armory behind a powered door with a switch, they should be safe. That way you might be able to still display your items but if you want to be even safer about it, you can actually store weapons, not just armor, on the mannequins. It won't display the weapons, but they're safe in there. Now, there's certainly other ways to secure your junk, like creating a safe room that can only be accessed through your workshop mode. But if you want to stay in the immersion of it, try these two methods first. Tip number 14. I also mentioned in that video that the table where I'd placed all the tools in my Jamaica Plain schoolhouse was safe because it was from the newer Vault-Tec DLC. However, I spoke too soon because literally the day after I posted that video, I came back to the schoolhouse and all the tools had fallen through to the floor. So here's what I did. I pillar glitched in a couple of rubber mats into the table to create an extra catch-all mesh. And so far it's worked like a charm. So this technique might also work for display cases and other places where you can hide a mat. Now I can't guarantee it for you, but it could very well be the next best solution other than a mod. Tip number 15. Lastly, in my spark creation video, I mentioned in my technique that you needed to exit workshop mode in order to trigger it. 
Turns out that you only need to hit the cancel button instead of exiting completely out of workshop. So much faster and easier than going in and out of workshop mode. All right, class, that's 15 miscellaneous tips to make your settlement building easier. I'll come out with a part two at the end of the No Mod Shop class series with 15 more that I compile. Some from videos I haven't even made yet. It's been awesome learning things from you guys as well through this series. And even though I consider myself an expert, I certainly don't know everything. As my old Kung Fu teacher once told me when I got my black belt years ago, or sash as they called in Kung Fu, mastery is a continuous journey, never a destination. Thanks so much for watching, guys. Be sure to throw a like on the video and share it around. Sub for more awesome settlement tips like this. See you in the next video. Happy building and class dismissed.